multitasking and <laughs> Eternally, my love's strong. 
questions, Lord, questions for you and questions about you. Use our questions, please, to bring us closer to you. We open our minds. We open our hearts. Amen. You may be seated. Yes. 
some hearts to color, and so I have those. And I also have question marks, so it could be a way to think about what are the questions that you might have uh, for, for God, what are the questions uh, you might have for the other grown-ups here in, in the sanctuary with you. And for our children that are at home, or all those that are worshiping with us at home, if you'd like to have a bag delivered to you, uh, please send me an email, pastorwendyhs at gmail.com, and I would be happy to make sure that you get a copy, uh, you get um, a bag to use at home as well. So all are invited to participate. And let's sing, uh, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. <coughs> She starts her chemo, um, and uh, it's it's actually spread to her brain. But keep her in your prayers. She's only fifty six. Thank you. Um, Don Bonins. Um, he's the brother of my really good friend Karen that recently passed. Um, he's struggling mightily with lung cancer right now and having a hard time of it. And their mother is in memory care over at Story Point in Grove City, so they've got a really heavy burden right now. So pray hard. I'd just like to be joyful for the ongoing revival that's going on in Kentucky. I have one. My sister's having surgery tomorrow on her foot. Her name's Connie, and my brother-in-law had surgery last Monday on his back, and he's struggling with um, pain right now. His name's Clee. Let's pray. Merciful 
merciful God, we come seeking mercy. Mercy for ourselves. Mercy for our communities. And mercy for all those that we're walking alongside who are wrestling with real deep concerns and health issues, oh Lord. Lord, sometimes we look at our lives, we look at what's going on in the world, and we're lost. We give thanks that we can always turn to you, oh Lord. When we doubt, when we have fears, when we're not sure how we might take the next faithful step, you are there, there to guide us, to give us wisdom, to give us courage, oh Lord. Continue to hold us in your hands, oh Lord. Guide us. Receive us into your holy presence, O oh Lord. Lord, we know that in so many ways, we're not worthy to be in your presence, O oh Lord. The words of our mouths are not always ones that glorify you, O oh Lord. Sometimes even our good deeds are filled with mixed intentions, O oh Lord. Forgive us. Set us straight, O oh Lord. Turn us around and set us on your path, O oh Lord. Lord, continue to guide us. Lord, be with each and every person we have named today. Be with those that are on our prayer list. Those that are on our hearts. Those things that trouble us so deeply that we just can't spit the words out, oh Lord. Be with us. We give thanks that you never leave us. Put your healing touch upon us, O oh Lord. Continue to turn us to you. Give us the strength to say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me wherever you need me to go. Send me and I will do as you ask, O oh Lord. Lord, be with us as we embark on our Lenten journey. May we be filled with peace and strength and awe and wonder. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now Mar Marla's going to read the scripture lesson for us. <clears throat> King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was a seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for a man of unclean lips, I live among people of clean, unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt was taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Marla's ready, let us join our voices together in song. <laughs> thinking about questions and doubts, and it drew me back many decades ago uh, to uh, when I was in college, it wasn't that many decades ago, but a while ago, <laughs> feels like it, uh, and I, I had a professor that, um, for, for a class, and I went to them often because I had questions. It was a class that I really loved, and I was trying to soak up as much as I could. I'd go to office hours, and I would ask questions and I would get answers, and it, it was the most beautiful thing. It helped me to understand things more clearly. And some of my um, classmates really struggled with going and asking questions to this professor, and I really didn't understand because it was so wonderful, because it was a subject I loved, I knew a lot about, I had this wonderful interaction. And then I had this professor for another class, where I was so lost at times. I knew I had questions, but I didn't even know what questions to ask. Anyone ever been in that situation? You're like, I know I need to ask a question to go forward, but like, I'm so lost, I don't know how to articulate it. A few of you, have you experienced that? And so it was really hard for me to go to that professor. And, as, and I fell further and further behind in my understanding and progressing with this, which made it even harder to ask questions. And at some point, I just kind of had to look myself in the eye, like you do sometimes, and have that conversation with yourself and say, get over yourself. I had to get over all this anxiety I had because I felt little. When I went and asked questions, when I knew the subject and could ask good questions, it boosted my confidence. I felt strong and tall. And when I didn't know what I was doing, I felt like I was about missing. And I wonder sometimes if we don't experience that whole range of feelings when we ask questions to God. 
that sometimes we go with confidence and understanding, knowing that we've read the scriptures, we've done as much as we can do, and we come to God with questions, and we're having kind of an interaction with, with God. And sometimes we come to God and we're just so lost. We don't even know where to begin. Maybe we feel so little that we feel like we're not worthy enough to ask questions of God. Or maybe that what we're wrestling with really isn't that important. Or maybe we wrestle with the notion like I did that you growing up, you don't question God. Doubt is, when I grew up, doubt was perceived as something to be ashamed of because you didn't trust God. And so, and from that spirit of failing God, I didn't want to interact as much with God. But things came up that I just had to ask God about. Because answers like God, everything is God's will. Sometimes bad things happen. And I was like, that's not aligned with who I know God to be. So I had to wrestle with my own doubts and my own Questions and bringing those to God. And God wants to hear your questions. God wants to sit with you in whatever doubts that you may have. And we see that in this text from Isaiah today. See, Isaiah had doubts about whether he could truly speak for God. And I have to say that if anyone is very, very confident that they can speak for God and know the heart and mind of God, I'm a little skeptical. (laughs) Just because God is so vast, so powerful, there's so little in many respects that we understand of God. So Isaiah took this very seriously in saying, can I be God's prophet? Can I speak for God? But instead of hiding his doubts, hiding in shame, hiding from feeling too small, he shared it with God. And God responded to Isaiah. And the response is what we see, we heard Marla read in the text, and I'm going to come to that. But as a result of this, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived had the strength to prophesy, had the strength to go and say what needed to be said. Because the scriptures that are right after this are ones that Jesus talks about in all four Gospels. This notion that people won't hear, people won't see, because people's hearts are not open to God. Not because God is not trying to let people see, not because God doesn't want you to hear, but because people are not receptive to God. That's the world that Isaiah was going into. This world that was on the cusp of war, and it was war, and he prophesied through their time of the Syrophoenician War, of of the exile to Babylon. That's the time period in which Isaiah was out speaking the word of God to the people. It was not an easy thing. Many prophets were murdered. It was very risky business. But I believe that this vision of Isaiah, that Isaiah experienced, helped give him the strength and the courage that he needed to follow God's will. We're told that it happened in the year that King Uzziah died. It happened at a real time. And in a real place, in the temple. In those those days, people felt like you had to go to the temple to experience God. The holiest of holy places was in the temple. It was a place people might expect to see and experience And friends, we have a God that we worship that shows up. Praise God. God shows up. This incredible vision, I've been sitting with this vision all week, and I just, it's just so glorious. There's the Lord up on a high throne. So imagine a high throne. Imagine the temple 
huge place, much bigger than this sanctuary here, up on a high throne. God is there. And there's the hem. The hem of God's garment there. The little train. The train of it. Imagine how huge it is. This isn't like my little robe here. This is ginormous. The vastness of God is spoken of in here. And there were seraphim. And I didn't know what seraphim were. In my study Bible says they're cobras with wings. And in the Egyptian culture, the, the seraphim guarded the gods. So in this description, it's all backwards. They're not guarding God. They're covering their eyes, which is a sign of, of feeling like God is so holy that they can't see God. We see that in, in the, throughout the Old Testament, that notion of covering your eyes. Because that brightness, that light of God is just so blinding for us. So instead of protecting God, they're covering their eyes, they're covering their feet, and they're flying around, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. These are words we repeat every month as part of our communion liturgy. Holy, holy, holy Lord. And the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. This was a full body experience. This vision that Isaiah had. And I wonder as we have these experiences or even listen to Isaiah's vision of God, how do you feel? Are you worthy to be in the presence of God? God says we are because God makes us worthy. Isaiah says, woe to me. He recognizes his own uncleanliness. He recognizes his own brokenness, his own sinfulness. And the brokenness and sinfulness of the world around him. Sound familiar? We live in a world like that. It's this beautiful vision. And then the seraphim come to him with this coal, and they put it on his, on his mouth. It's a way of cleansing him. It's a way of saying you're forgiven. You are worthy. You are made worthy because the Lord God Almighty makes you worthy. Your, skin, your sin is atoned for. And the Lord says, whom will I send? And Isaiah said, me! Send me! And as I've been wrestling with this vision of God, I keep asking myself, how might I respond? And I wonder if somehow in the time frame of coming and approaching God, going to the temple, making pilgrimages, and I'm working hard to get there, that in our translation to nowadays, when we know that God is with us no matter where we are, is somehow maybe God's become a little small. And as I've been sitting with this image, I thought, what is what might the what might God be speaking to us today? What might be God be speaking to the church today? What is it that God asks us? Do you have ears to hear? Do you have eyes to see? Will your heart be open? Will you be open? And I pray this Lenten season that I, that we can all see more clearly the vastness and the glory of God that is all around us. For it only takes a touch of that to change our lives, to change the course of history. It only took a tiny touch, a tiny touch to Isaiah's lips for him to go and do what he needed to do. To be the prophet that God called him to be. And friends, we live in a world that could use 
a little touch of God here and there. And some of you are saying, amen, <laughs> there's a lot of touch of God needed. We live in a world where, where violence is much more the way than peacemaking. When conflict and being in conflict with someone is more important than coming together. Winning our own side is more important than compromise in so many arenas of our world. And friends, God is there. God can make a difference in all of these things in our world. It only takes a little time. I think about Luke's story of a, a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. She'd spent all her money seeing all the doctors, and nobody could help her. Nobody could help her. When Jesus passed by, she touched him, touched the little hem of his garment, and she was healed. That's the power of the Lord. The power of the Lord to heal her after she'd been bleeding for 12 years. I think of a more modern example. I think of Dr. Martin Luther King. And th this is the story that comes to mind. He was doing his job as a pastor, walking with his con congregation when the Montgomery bus boycott began. He was a reluctant prophet. He was thrust into the national spotlight. He appeared to be confident, ready to lead, activate, advocating for nonviolent approaches to addressing racism, injustice, and violence. When he began, he assumed that the boycott would only last a few days and things would get back to normal. Days turned into weeks and into months. And the economic pain that was felt by so many threatened greater economic stability. Some of you may remember this. There were a lot of people that were afraid, and fear does many things in us, and it comes out through us in many ways when we don't turn and turn to God in those times of fear. And he received many threats for his life. Towards the end, he received as many as 40 threats a day. I don't know how you continue when you have that many threats a day for your life. And late Friday night, January 27, 1956, he came home after a long day of strategizing and planning, and his family was asleep, and he was restless. He was on edge, and the phone rang. And the, the voice on the line said, leave Montgomery immediately if you have no wish to die. Leave immediately. His fear surged, as ours would too. And he hung up the phone and went to his kitchen, put on a pot of coffee, and sat down at the kitchen table. And he wrote these words in his book, Stride Towards Freedom. He said, I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. Any of us been in a situation where you wanted to move out of the situation? In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. Quote, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I'm afraid. The people are looking for, to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seems as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And God will be at your side forever. 
Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. Three days later, the threat was realized. A bomb blasted his house and his family barely escaped the catastrophic harm. King later wrote, he said, strangely enough, I accepted the word of the bombing calmly. My religious experience a few nights before had given me the strength to face it. That tiny little voice, those few words from God, that little touch gave him the strength to face the situation that was before him. And his strength in turn strengthened the community. Amidst the rubble, King addressed the crowd and raised his hands. We must meet hate with love. Remember, if I'm stopped, this movement will not stop because God is with this movement. So he was speaking these words to a crowd that had gathered at his house within an hour of this event. People might have wanted revenge. He certainly wanted to, their voices to be heard. And with strength, King said, go home with this glorious faith and radiant assurance. The glorious faith that the movement will not stop because God is with this movement. That strength from his to point to God, to name God, to be confident in that God was there in the midst calling them to continue to work for justice, but not to do it in ways that were violent and harmful to others. At King's word, the mob dissipated, their mood disarmed, and their ears ringing with the message of the Gospels, non-violence. Years later, King wrote, it seemed to me at that moment I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, Stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. I heard the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Friends, that still small voice that he heard from God changed the course of history it changed the response that he had as a prominent leader to the violence that was inflicted upon him. Friends, do you still believe that the still small voice of God can change things for you? Can change things for our community? Can change things for our world? That God is still speaking and giving visions to us. Showing us what God desires for us, for our world. Friends, God is so big, so vast, so powerful. It only takes a touch. And some of you may be sitting here and saying, it only takes a touch and why didn't my friend, my loved one, why didn't they survive? We're going to continue to talk about hard questions throughout Lent. Because these wonderful, glorious visions, and this hope that is ours, also brings up questions. It brings up doubts. Don't shy away from them. The Lord is calling, come to me. Come all. Come to me, bring me your doubts, bring me your questions, and I will help you sort them out. May it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's sing Stand By Me. <clears throat>
beautiful prayer for its own time through the joys and through the sorrows. I want to draw your attention to the announcements that were included with the bulletin. One is I've already spoke of, there's a Lent in the bag, and there are the instructions that go along with that. And I invite you to, to use that in whatever way is helpful and inspirational for you and for uh, those around you. You might want to have a group to do it with, or you might feel most comfortable doing it by yourself. Um, Tracy has offered a beautiful Lenten prayer that she that was anonymously written uh, that goes along with it. Um, and a prayer, and that's a good reminder of the Lenten season that is upon us that starts on Wednesday. It's a time of drawing closer to God and centering our lives on God. A way of rediscovering our connection with God. And a time of letting go of those things that interrupt our relationship with God and with God's people. I want to invite you uh, this week to come to the Ash Wednesday service. It's a community service. Uh, myself and several pastors will be helping to lead that at David's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canal Winchester. Um, it will be a time to receive ashes and also to receive Holy Communion. And all are welcome to receive communion in that service. Um, if you'd like to help deliver ashes and communion, or if you um, are watching online, or if you're in the sanctuary and are not able to get out in the evening and would like someone to bring you communion and ashes on Wednesday, uh, please give me a call or send me an email so that we can make sure that you receive those gifts. Um, if anyone is interested in singing with the choir at the Ash Wednesday service, please uh, see me and I can look up on my phone what time you need to be there before the service to join in singing with the choir. Um, the Madison Area Community Choir event is next uh, Saturday, so please keep the members of our church family in your prayers as they prepare to bring joy and laughter to the community um, next weekend. And there are some tickets available for that, so please see Kim if you would like to attend. Um, next Sunday after church, um, we will begin a series of uh, discussions with regards to uh, discernment in our next steps as a congregation, and want to invite everyone to stay after church and to be a part of that, and I want to thank Raymond for his uh, leadership with that. There's also in the bulletin many ways to live out our faith in sharing this love of God uh, with our neighbors in need through the giving of, of items um, and ways to support the church and the ministries here through the giving of your tithes and offerings. Are there other announcements that I have forgotten? I need to have Tracy. I know it's several weeks away, as Kim reminded me, but um, Monday, Thursday, we will be having the um, soup, salad. Um, I already got desserts all covered and drinks, so just be thinking about that. Thank you. Yes, so we will gather for dinner before Monday, Thursday service, and that will be April the 6th, and it will be here before we know it. And want to have everyone mark your calendars and plan to attend that if you can. There's food pantry this week. There's food pantry this week, Mary Jane said. So um, <laughs> if you can help in Asheville on Thursday morning, please show up ready to do whatever you do. Are there other announcements? As you go forth from here, I hope you're filled with the awe and wonder of the Lord. Filled with the love and light of God. Go and tell someone how you have seen the light of God. How you've seen it in your life, in the community, in someone else. Offer your questions and doubts to God. Listen to the doubts and questions of those around you. And remember that for some in this world, love is a stranger. Peace is a stranger. May they find in us to be the most generous of friends. In the name of Jesus, amen.